Well, hey there, my name's Kyle, and welcome to Living Hope Online. Thank you so much for choosing to spend some of your time with us. Hey, before we get into our content, I wanna invite you to subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications so you don't miss out on anything that we have for you. We're here for you. Good morning, Living Hope. It's uh, a pleasure to be here worshiping with you at home. Uh, we pray that you are doing well. We pray that during this time of shut-in, this time of quarantine, um, you're able to see the Lord's hand of blessing. I know it's so easy to focus on what we do not have, uh, to focus on that we're, we're not together as we do desire to be, um, but how God is still working in and among us. And uh, one way he's worked in our family at the Fleming household is he's, he's impressed on us to spend more time um, with him. 
and uh, we've instilled this recently. We've been trying to do this with our daughter. Uh, she's six and a half years old. She's finally reading and writing enough to go off and have a quiet time with the Lord. And she came in uh, with her journal on Tuesday, and uh, this is what she had written down. And it just was a nice challenge to me from my kid. Uh, about how the Lord can work and you can still find joy in the things that he has created and this is what she had written down she said I love you Lord you make joy you make me happy you made me you love me you made the wind that whistles in the trees your song is like birds in the trees sing the song you give me joy if we can, for the remainder of this time that we're apart, see how the Lord is working in your life. Ask Him to reveal new blessings that He is ready to bestow on you. And perhaps uh, take this time to draw closer to Him as, uh, as we are apart. Let's continue worshiping together with our next song.
So last week we finished the book of Romans, a book in which the Apostle Paul teaches and reminds people of some foundational truths. And they weren't new, but they may have felt that way to many who he was speaking to. And so for me, coming out of the book of Romans, really the one truth that I think sums up the book is found right away in chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, where Paul says this, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, 
as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul takes his readers back to the Old Testament to show how these truths are not new. And this truth here he takes from Habakkuk, a prophet who struggles through believing in the goodness of God, despite all the suffering and evil in the world. And man, if that isn't relevant for us today, but it's this last line that Paul takes from Habakkuk that says it all for me. The righteous shall live by faith. In these six words, the foundation is set for us to build on. That faith in the right thing leads to a life lived the right way. And that the good news of the gospel is not something to be ashamed of because the good news is that even in a world filled with evil things, broken things, God loves us enough to offer healing if we're willing to have trust in him for it and follow him towards it. And that's the truth this whole next series is going to explore. What does a life of faith look like? You know, throughout Paul's letters to the Romans, he goes back to his Bible, the Old Testament, time and time again to show that this truth isn't new. And so over the next few weeks, Al and I want to follow in Paul's example and look at some Old Testament brothers and sisters to see the model they give us for a heart of faith and a life of righteousness. As we spoke about this series and I began to prepare, almost immediately the story of Naaman was placed on my heart. And To be honest, at first I didn't know why, but then I went back and I read it, and its reminder was what I needed. See, Christ and the Spirit know what they're doing, and they focused me in on an aspect of the story I hadn't really considered before. So I thought for this morning I would share with you all this story and how I think it serves as a really challenging model of righteousness and a righteous life lived by faith. So, The story of Naaman is found in 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. But before we get into the text, I want to give you a quick picture of the world we'll be entering. So the book before this begins the story of the nation of Israel after David. And, uh, well, it's, it's not great. And so by our story, civil war has split the nation of God in two with the northern Israel and southern Judah. And neither nation has a great record when it comes to a life lived uh, in, in righteousness or faith. And so for the north, they're currently getting beat up by the nation of Syria, who's in the process of building an empire. But despite it all, we get to read and see how God continued to work and move. And so scattered throughout this story of First and Second Kings are placed these examples of faith and righteousness despite the odds, despite the despair, and despite the distractions. So let's jump in to 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, Would that my lord were with the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Okay, so Naaman starts this story as a Syrian warmonger. He's the commander of the Syrian army. He's well-known, well-respected, wealthy. And so from a social distance, Naaman seemed to have life under control. But when you get a little closer, you see that this man had a problem that was out of his control. In a battle, he was powerless to conquer. And if his career choice is any indicator, this disease must have driven him crazy. His whole identity was built upon his strength and ability to win, yet here he is with a battle he was destined to lose and a weakness just written all over his body. Naaman must have felt hopeless and probably helpless too. And I don't know about you, but for me, these are the kinds of problems that would keep me up at night, the things that are out of my control, the things that remind me that no matter how hard I work and how well I plan, I'm broken. Has anyone ever made you feel broken? Has anything ever made you feel helpless or hopeless? Those kinds of feelings are heavy and Naaman wanted out. So as we read, we find that his servant girl, this girl that he kidnapped from Israel, knows a guy and he may be able to help. And it it sounds a little out there, but it's the first lead he's had on a solution. So he takes it. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothes. 
And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. Naaman goes on a mission to find healing. He feels hope for the first time in a long time, and he just puts all his eggs in this basket, man. He he raids his closet for what he can sell. He hits up the ATM and maxes out his deposit, and then he heads to the house of his enemies to ask for help. Naaman is desperate. And, And you know, perhaps at first this seems humble or something, that he would be willing to go to his enemies, admit his need, and ask for help. But if you read a little closely, you see that Naaman puts all his faith, all his hope in the wrong places. See, Naaman was told to speak to the prophet of God, but he went to the king instead. Naaman went where he thought the power would be, and he brought his wealth because he thought he had something to offer. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he's seeking a quarrel with me. Man, if I'm not Naaman, how many times do I rely on myself if I have anything to offer? And for how long will I keep looking to everything and everyone else but God for help or the solution? This king has nothing for Naaman. Naaman puts his faith in the wrong place, and he came up short. Church, faith in the wrong things always fails. It's a confident man walking on thin ice. No matter how hard you hope, it's going to fail. Naaman puts his faith in the wrong things, and it got him nowhere. So listen, where have you been putting your faith? In our current circumstances, I think we're finding out, aren't we? As we see businesses closed and people without work and hospitals packed like never before, my heart breaks because I know so many people place their bets in the wrong things and their worlds are crumbling because their faith was in those things. All their eggs were in the wrong baskets. They were walking on thin ice and it's finally giving out. Are you one of those people right now watching from home? Are you one of those people who feels like you've lost or are losing everything? If so, I want to let you know that I'm sorry. And and second, uh, that me and the church here, we're here to help you however we can. But most importantly, I want to plead with you to turn your hope to Christ, the only healer, the only one who this crisis didn't surprise and who's the only one with a plan that won't fail. We don't need uh, another king or a ruler right now. We need the king of kings and ruler of rulers Whatever happens, seeking after God for help and hope is the best advice I could give you because faith in the wrong things always fails. But the prophet Elisha, when he heard the man of God, that that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me that he may know that there's a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horse and his chariots and stood at the door of Elijah's house. And Elijah sent a message to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hands over the place and cure the leper. And, and, and not Abana or Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel, could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. So here's the story so far. Naaman is a man with an incurable disease and he finds out someone may have the cure. So he goes to someone else to see if he can buy it from them and he can't. So he goes to the one he should have in the first place. Naaman's given the cure for free, and he's told he just needs to follow the directions, but instead he goes home sick and angry because he doesn't like the means of healing. It's not the way. He wants it done. It's not the fix he wanted. So to put it clearly, Naaman would rather die than be healed if it means submitting to a plan other than his own. Pride. And doesn't that sound familiar? Like if we're really being honest, how often have we asked a question or asked for help just to turn it down because it's not what we wanted it to be? Pride can be so dangerous. And and I've watched pride ruin relationships, destroy opportunities, and 
prevent so many good things from being accomplished because we let it get in the way. And I've been on both sides of that, and I think we all have, because I know we all have some blemish, some personal leprosy that we're desperately trying to hide or cover up. And I know you probably think that you're doing everything you can to control it or fix it, but I also know because I'm right there with you that when faced with the truth, we, we would often walk away then take the steps necessary for true healing to take place. And sin is so real, and it's a liar, and it, it gives the worst advice, but hopefully we all have a few good friends who are willing to set us straight, because a good friend will remind you that pride doesn't fix problems. Pride doesn't fix problems. It never does. It gets in the way. It drags things out. It, it blinds us, and it makes us stupid. See, like Naaman, we all have things that we need healing from, and I can pretend to know what that is for you. It goes so far beyond physical needs, but what's common for us all is that no matter how we're broken, we all are desperate for healing. And in our pride, we often reject the cure, and in our desperation, we often put our faith in the wrong things. But if we could all listen to wisdom and practice humility, I believe that we can hear the voice of truth. For Naaman, it came from his servant once more. But his servant came near and said to him, My father, it, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God and he and all his company and he came and stood before him and said, Behold, I know that there is one God in all the earth, but in Israel. So accept now a present from your servant. Naaman, despite his success, had a problem he couldn't solve. When told who had the answer, he looked to someone else and when given the cure, he rejected it out of pride. Yet when he took his very first step of obedience, when he put his faith in the right place, that faith, however small, made good on its promises. I said earlier that faith in the wrong thing always fails, but I believe the opposite's also true, that even a mustard seed of faith in the right thing will never fail. See, even in the most skeptical of situations, the most skeptical man walking on thick ice is going to be okay. For Naaman, before that day, I don't know how much hope he had in those waters or their God. I don't know how confident he was that, that when he walked into that water and walked out, he'd be clean. But I do know that he hoped enough to try. It's like Paul said, the righteous shall live by faith. It doesn't have to be the most. It doesn't even have to be without doubts. But it does have to be faith that leads to obedience in action. What I'm saying and what this story shows us is that faith leads to obedience and that leads to life. And James 2.22 says, says it this way, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Faith leads to action and act of faith is life. The righteous will live by faith. So I know what you're all thinking right now. Dude, Naaman is a terrible model for faith. He did just about everything wrong and he barely made it out of the story alive. He didn't listen well. He put his faith in power and money. He was prideful and arrogant and he reluctantly followed the instructions he was given. And yeah, you're right. And I guess for me, the point of it all is that now you know where we stand. Like based upon my observations and experiences, I think you and I probably have a lot in common with Naaman, except for the warmongering and probably the success too. But really, he's not the model of faith in the story, is he? No, if we go back to the beginning and, and read carefully, there's someone else who is, and I think she's the reason God placed this story on my heart this week. So flip back with me to verse 2 and 3. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel. She worked in the service of Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, Would that my lord were with the prophet who's in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. This unnamed girl is my hero right now. Like she gets kidnapped, kidnapped, ripped from her family. And instead of praying for her captor's demise, which is unavoidable based on his disease, she seeks his healing. Instead of believing that her God had abandoned her, she hopes more people would experience his goodness. 
And when her master comes back angry, she has the boldness of faith to call him out on his pride and send him back. Like what slave has the confidence to call out their master and set them straight? Like have you ever even done that to your boss? See this unnamed girl like Naaman is given a problem that's out of her control. She's a slave in that house just as much as he's a slave to a sick body. And like Naaman, she places all of her faith in one basket, but she doesn't look to some king. She knows he can't save her. No, she places all of her faith in the king of kings. She's obedient and faithful to whomever God places over her. She submits the authority given to her, even if it makes her a slave, and she doesn't fight for her freedom just because that may be what she wants. She submits and serves with humility to be the best slave she can be, to love her enemies and seek their good. And she does so as a model of righteousness to those around her and, and for us today. I mean, how many of us could say that we would do what she did? Not me. In fact, in so many ways, this story isn't very American. Submission to power we disagree with or don't represent. Uh, to, to willingly submit to the same people who we feel stole from us, to give up freedom we think we deserve. It's not the American way, but it is Christ-like. And I need you to seriously consider those two worldviews on this subject because they don't mesh well, but one of them needs to take priority, humility, submission to authority, service, sacrifice, love for neighbor, and enemy. We, like Naaman, would often rather walk away from healing than follow those instructions, but here they are as our example of faith. And so just like Christ humbled himself to become like us and submitted himself to the powers of this world and yielded his life for the sake of others, we're to live likewise. And this is a hard truth, but it's not new. We are all like Naaman, but we're supposed to be like that unnamed slave girl in a land not our own, yet ambassadors of a kingdom and a God who is and whose ways are foreign to everyone around us. Regardless of what hardships may come our way or what brokenness we're carrying around, our calling is to live lives of faith that leads to obedience because it leads to life. So what do you feel slave to? Is it your job? Is it your home right now? What problem is affecting your life at this moment that reminds you that you can't fix it? With everything going on across the globe right now, it's my hope that you won't get distracted or confused about who has the power to fix and what steps are needed for healing. It comes from one source, one God. My prayer is that you'll be seeking his wisdom and direction during this time and, and deeper for your daily walk, that you won't be putting your faith in the wrong places. That's nothing but thin ice over there, but that you'd walk in obedience and faith on the path that doesn't fail and whose directions always leads to healing in the end. The righteous shall live by faith. Let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you uh, for the story uh, and that you were able to use it in my life this week to remind me that I'm Naaman, but I don't always want to be. That I want to be this unnamed girl. But like Naaman, even, even a small amount of faith is enough because what's important is you, that I put my faith in you. And so Lord, I pray for all of us that despite the distractions and the doubts and maybe even the despair that we'd put all of our hope in you, however much or little we have. Because like Naaman, even a small amount of faith is enough. If it's faith that leads to obedience, it leads to life and that life is in you. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, have a great week. Before we say goodbye, I'd love to fill you in on a few things that you need to know about here at Living Hope. And so first, just because we may not be together in person, that doesn't mean that we still can't stay connected. There's still a lot going on, and the easiest way for you to find out more is by checking out our website, linked in the description below. And second, we still want to hear from you, whether it's uh, what prayers or praises we can join you in, or, or just to catch up, there's a link to our online connection card down in that description as well. And again, no matter where you are, we're glad you're here. God loves you. We love you. And we hope to see you again soon.